Okay, number, the third word we want to take a look at that's critical in evangelism is what is faith? What does it mean to believe? <clears throat> so far, we've looked at the gospel of grace, but how do you appropriate it? How do you acquire it for yourself? Um, <clears throat> some say... Uh, Okay, some people will say, re, kind of redefine faith. And uh, I'll be honest with you, probably 90% of your popular writers today redefine faith. So I'm a minority, but I want to throw it out just for you to consider and think about. Some people say, well, you're saved by grace through faith without works, but if you don't have works, you're not saved. Now, they say it in a lot of different ways, but basically they backload the gospel with some kind of works. Now, sometimes they don't do it in an initial uh, presentation of the gospel. They wait till they get you into church, and then they lay the big guilt trip on you. Oh, you say you're saved, but you won't do this? Uh, now, it's really horrific overseas. I can tell you story of, after story of how pastors just wield a, an iron rod over their people. In America, we're so independent-minded that most of us, you know, won't put up with that. But um, you have to be careful in what I call trying to sneak works into the back door to backload the gospel by redefining faith. <clears throat> um, the, the problem I have with that, and let me just briefly touch on that, is if somebody were to offer their wife to another man, would you say that person is a believer? I would struggle to say that person is a believer. And yet that's exactly what Abraham did in Genesis 18 when he offered Sarah to King Abimelech. Uh, or if somebody offered their two virgin daughters, this is even a worse example, uh, to some sexual deviance in order to save himself and other people. Would you say that person is a believer? Whew. Man, I'd have a hard time saying that. Or if in that same situation, he got drunk and impregnated his two daughters. It's, it's beyond my imagination to conceive that person could be a believer. And yet that's exactly what Abraham's nephew did, Lot. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Peter refers to Lot twice, not once, but twice, as the righteous man. How was Lot righteous? He was righteous in the eyes of God. Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, it's not our works. Now, this is not to encourage sinful behavior. That's horrific. It's heinous. It's horrible. And yet sometimes, even in the lives of believers, we see some very despicable action that is shameful to the gospel. Um, but there's so many illustrations. The children of Israel, I have some theologians, I know them, who say that the two or three million Israelis that wandered in the wilderness, that they were not saved because they did not enter God's rest. Um, I remind them, you know, well, Moses didn't enter the promised land. Are you saying Moses wasn't saved? Oh, well, no, no, he's an example, uh, an exception. And I think they fail to realize there's two kinds of rest. Romans 11:28 talks about Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me that I'm gentle and meek in spirit, and I will give you rest. There's a rest you can have through faith in Christ alone for salvation. And then there's a rest you can have as you go on to serve him with a grateful heart. Now, it kind of centers on the idea of, do you have to obey the gospel? Is there obedience involved in the gospel? <clears throat> or how do you obey the gospel? Second Thessalonians, uh, let me get the right verse reference here. I just changed my notes a little bit. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. It says this, verse 8, He will punish those who do not know God. Know God in what way? 
You can know God as your savior or you could just not know him very richly. Um, like Jesus said, how long have I been with you and yet you do not know me? In John chapter 14, we know his disciples had already believed in him. So he's not talking about knowing him as savior. They're talk he's talking about knowing him richly and deeply. Uh, in this case, it's talking about not knowing Christ at all. And to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse nine, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. So he's talking about eternal condemnation here, not knowing him as savior and from the majesty of his power. In verse 10, in the day that he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. You obey the gospel by believing the gospel, by trusting in the gospel. And then in verse 10, this includes you because you believed our testimony in him. So to obey the gospel means to believe in him. Some people try to extend that beyond that. And the problem with that is if you say, well, you have to also obey Christ in your Christian walk, well then to what degree? And they never give you an answer on that. And if you can't know to what degree you have to serve him or obey him, then how can you ever know that you have eternal life? Well, you can't. Uh, and they try to get around that by saying, well, you can know you have eternal life, but you can't be certain you have eternal life. I've heard a very popular uh, proponent of this view uh, say that. They're so fearful that people will take advantage of the grace of God and live in a, a very lascivious way that they try to sneak some kind of works in the back door. And I think it's a, a sad commentary of their exegesis and uh, some of their exposition. But I just leave that with you to think about. So what do you do with the gospel? It must be mixed with faith to be activated. Hebrews chapter four, verse two and three says this, for indeed the gospel was preached among us, among you, uh, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith by those who heard it. For we who have believed, again, there's the obedience required, those who have believed, do enter that rest. Uh, that's the New King James Version, which I think is more clear on that. Uh, okay. I remember one time I was in um, Kenya, and I get up at four o'clock in the morning, usually. In fact, I was up this morning at four o'clock. It's just kind of what I usually do. And my field director, for some reason, his name is Ken, he doesn't like to get up at four o'clock in the morning. And uh, so we agreed that he could set up the coffee machine. And then all I have to do is push a button and it makes me a pot of coffee. It's right there in my room. So it's real easy, four o'clock, uh, I get my cup of coffee, I get busy on my uh, computer work and things like that. Well, one morning I got up, I hit the button, went over to get a cup of coffee, couldn't smell it brewing, and it, it didn't work. What had happened was he'd put the coffee uh, grounds in it, but he forgot to put water in the back. So if you don't mix water with coffee, it, it has no value, it's no good. In the same way, you can know the gospel of grace. You can understand it. You can even kind of accept it. Well, maybe it's true. Maybe Jesus really did live. But if you haven't mixed it with faith, if you haven't put your trust in Christ for your salvation, you're not saved eternally. Okay. Uh, maybe you've shared the gospel with someone and they say something like, oh, well, I believe that, I've always believed that. But you know in your heart of hearts that they really don't. It's just the feeling you have, they really don't understand it. And one reason may be because they don't understand what the word faith or what the word believe means. So you may have to clarify three things. Uh, first of all, the definition, uh, the object of that faith, and the fact that it's faith alone as the means through which we receive God's grace and his gospel. A, capital A, define the definition. Um, it comes from two basic Greek words. One's the verb, uh, pistuo, 
means to trust in, to depend on, to rely on. <clears throat> and the, the noun, which is faith, pistis, which again means to have faith, put your faith in something, to trust in someone, uh, to believe in someone in that capacity. Um, number two, two kinds of definition in English and in Spanish and in Russian and in Dutch. A lot of languages have two different two basic uh, definitions of faith. There's what I call an incomplete definition and a complete definition. Uh, incomplete, small a. It's the idea of only agreeing that something is true, simply accepting it in that sense. Yeah, I, I, you know, I agree uh, that George Washington was uh, you know, the founding father, the first president of the United States which he really wasn't, by the way, but that's another point. Uh, you can accept certain truths about people, agree with people, but that doesn't mean that you have trusted in that particular uh, object. Uh, a modern language usually conveys the incomplete definition of faith or to believe. For example, I believe my wife is beautiful, and I can't see her, but from what I remember, I believe that she is beautiful. That doesn't mean I'm going to trust her with my guns. I, I do hunt as a blind person, and I really don't trust her with my guns. Uh, although I did get her a new shotgun, just for when I'm gone, but uh, that's another story. I don't trust her with my other guns, which are a little more complicated to work. Uh, so there's a difference between accepting something and actually trusting in something. Um, or if I told you I caught a fish this big, believe me, I caught a fish this big. All I'm asking you to do is accept that is true to kind of agree with it. I'm not promising you a fish dinner. There's no benefit promised to you by agreeing with that particular uh, uh, you know, suggestion. It, there's a very slight difference between the two. And sometimes it bleeds over into trusting in Christ, which is good. But sometimes I wonder if they really grasp the definition of the word faith. I think that it lacks something. It's kind of a watered down or incomplete definition, I think, of the biblical concept of what it means to believe in Christ. <clears throat> it doesn't reflect the Greek word pistuo or pistis. Uh, the word in the, in, in the New Testament means more than simply to accept something uh, as true or to agree with something. Now, page 13 in the workbook, small letter B, the complete definition has two basic parts. Uh, one, to accept something is true. You need to accept it as true. You need to agree with it. But then secondly, you need to trust in that object in order to gain something. And what we gain by trusting in Christ is the forgiveness of our sin and eternal life. In fact, 33 things happen to a person when they believe in Christ internally, inwardly. Not necessarily outwardly, that usually comes later and should come later. But sometimes, like even in the, the life of Lot, we don't read anything good in the life of Lot towards the end of his life. Um, similar to the use, <coughs> it's uh, in Spanish, for example, it's uh, yo quiero, I want you. Uh, that can also mean I love you. Now, if you tell your wife that you want her like you want candy, well, there's a difference between those two things, okay? Uh, and in the same way, to believe can mean something different in different languages. In Russian, the same thing. Now, without using the word to trust in, to depend on, or to rely on, you may inadvertently be conveying uh, an incomplete definition of what the word faith or the word believe means. Um, small letter C, or is that capital letter C? Small letter C, okay. Uh, we can uh, demonstrate this in a couple of ways. One, grammatical proof, uh, it uses quite often pistol ace to trust in someone, it doesn't have to have the word ace, but it's, it's more clearly defined as to trust in someone. Um, so grammatically, there's some uh, 
at least some evidence that that's what the word means, which I believe it clearly does. Um, and then secondly, experientially. For example, Martin Luther, when he crawled up the sacred steps in Rome, um, he realized that that wasn't going to benefit him. That was not the way to heaven. The just shall live by faith. In Romans 1.17 is what he realized. It's simple faith a uh, person is justified and has life, has eternal life. It's not by your efforts, your good works, anything that you do on your part. Now, an illustration that I often use are three men in a parachute. The first man is a pilot, and then he's got two passengers. And he takes off, he's flying over the mountain range, and he, the pilot realizes, the first passenger, he realizes, <clears throat> rather the, the pilot realizes he didn't, fuel the plane. He's going to run out of gas. But the pilot does not accept the fact that the only way to be saved is with a parachute. They all have parachutes. He thinks in his arrogance that he can land the plane in the mountains. Plane goes down, crashes, he dies. Now, the second person in the plane, the first passenger, he has a parachute. Um, he's fearful. Uh, he believes. He accepts that the parachute is the only way to be saved, but he doesn't put it on. He doesn't trust it, so he doesn't jump out. Plane goes down, it crashes, he dies. Now the third person, the second passenger, he believes and accepts that the parachute's the only way to be saved. So he jumps out of the plane with a parachute and ultimately survives the, the plane incident. Now there's a very thin line between the, the two passengers, okay? One accepted it, but didn't trust in it. The other one accepted in it, believed in it, and trusted in it. And I think that kind of illustrates a distinction that I see in scriptures in terms of what faith means. Faith is, you know, to trust in Christ. Um, I'll use a chair illustration later, but let me uh, use another illustration. I had a friend of mine, his name's, uh, this is uh, Joe Shepherd is his name. I went to lunch with him last year and uh, we were getting ready to have a cold front come through. And I explained to Joe that I needed some firewood and wondered if he knew where I could purchase any. And uh, he's got 200 acres. He says, Dean, you don't have to buy any firewood. I'll, I'll make a gift. I'll give you some firewood. And I said, well, Joe, you don't understand. The cold front's coming in Friday. This is Wednesday. I need them by tomorrow. And he said, Dean, trust me. Believe me. It'll be there Thursday. I'll, I'll, have it, I'll have it at your house, you know, tomorrow. So Thursday came, and I hear some ruckus outside. I go outside, and there's Joe loading up my rack full of firewood. I went out, and I said, Joe, can I help? He says, you're blind. Just stay out of the way. You know, I, I, got, I got it. And now, I believe Joe. I didn't go out and try to purchase anything. I believe Joe. He brought me the firewood. I believed that he was gonna do it. I believed in him, I trusted in him. Now, did I have to promise him that I would come over to his house and help him move a piano? Did I have to promise him anything? No, it was a gift. He made it clear it was a gift. That's what faith is. And I'm very concerned when I hear theologians starting to tweak the definition of the word faith, of the word believe. I think they do it with good intentions. They want to encourage people to live a godly life. But the thing that motivates me most is knowing how much I'm forgiven. You know, it's those who are forgiven much that love much. I was listening to the book of Luke today and reminded of that. I have been forgiven so much more than any of you. I'm certain of that. And because of that, even though it may not be evident, I want to love a whole lot because I know how much I've been forgiven. Okay, number three. Uh, faith has basically two parts. Accepting the gospel is true and trusting in the gospel or in Christ alone for eternal salvation, okay? Okay, capital letter B. A second thing you might have to clarify is the object of faith. Uh, sometimes I'll draw one large circle and uh, I'll ask them, I'll ask a person, now you say you've believed in Christ, write down in this circle what you have believed in when you say you believed already. And 
Sometimes I say, well, you know, I go to church. I've had people say that before. Now, I can't see. I don't use this one anymore, but I used to use it. And it was pretty effective. It helped to crystallize and move the conversation forward other than saying, well, I don't believe you. You know, you're not telling the truth. Or I don't see it in your, you know, just ask them, what exactly did you believe in, did you trust in for eternal salvation when you say you believed already? Um, so capital letter C is clarify that it's through faith. That's the means, through Christ alone. The basis is grace in the gospel, the gospel of grace, and you receive it, you acquire it, appropriate it through faith in Christ. Uh, John 14, 6 makes it clear that the only way you get to heaven is through Christ. That's the one thing that upset that Muslim I was sitting next to on an airplane, and he wanted to smack me because he didn't like the idea that I quoted John 14, 6, that it's only by faith in Christ that a person can be saved. Okay. It's um, like I'm sure all of you that travel on an airplane, unless you travel with Donald Trump or the president, you have to go through a metal detector. You have to go through that metal detector. Uh, it's kind of funny. I didn't have to um, last time. Well, I, I don't have time for this story, but normally you have to go through a metal detector. In the same way, to get to heaven, there's only one door that you have to go through, and that's faith, trusting in Christ alone for your salvation. Um, Sometimes, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but there's some religions that are really big into Mary. And uh, I had a person say, you know, you just don't respect Mary. You don't pray to her. You don't revere her. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Suppose you came home after going out to dinner and a water pipe had burst in your house and there's water all over the floor. Who are you going to call? Are you going to call the plumber or the plumber's mother? Well, you call the plumber. And if you've got a sin problem, who do you call on? You don't call the Savior's mother, you call the Savior. He's the mediator between uh, us and God, is Jesus Christ. You don't call on somebody else. Uh, so we're saved on the basis of grace, through faith, which is the means, and that faith in the object of Christ the gospel, the fact that he did two things for us. What are the essential elements? Number one. Well, that was weak. Let's try that again. First essential element. Second. Rose from the dead. Okay. Very good. So it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works or effort on our part. So faith has two parts. Accept the gospel of Christ as true and trust, and trust in Christ. Not just to accept it, but to agree with it, but to trust in Christ alone. And the word trust usually conveys both meanings. So I, traditionally, I will use the word trust in Christ. Okay, now faith is often strongly contrasted to works. Some people try to make it into some kind of works anyway. Uh, Galatians 2.16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Three times he makes it clear that it's not by works. And th this is one verse. And three times Paul makes it clear that you're saved are justified by faith. Okay, workbook page 14. Fourth important word. What is repentance? Now this is a tricky one. Another question that sometimes comes up if you get into any kind of depth of conversation with someone that knows any kind of religion or religious type of theology. How does re repentance fit into salvation, our eternal salvation? Uh, biblical repentance is necessary for salvation, but it depends on how you define it, okay? Um, it tends to confuse people rather than clarify the gospel of grace. Um, number one, the issue is trusting in Christ alone for salvation. 
by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Number two, most people do not know the biblical definition of repentance or to repent. Uh, why is that? Well, it's a theological word, and it's not something you use at the dinner table. How often have you used the word repentance or repent? At the it's a theological word, and it's become loaded down with all kinds of theological definitions. So why use it? it I find it confusing to the unbeliever. Um, for example, uh, the Bible says that Jesus was a propitiation for our sins. Do we ever use that? You ever hear an evangelist use propitiation? Probably not. The satisfactory payment for our sins? Um, you don't hear that. Why? Because it's something that's confusing to the unbeliever. We need to put the cookies on the bottom shelf where it's easy for them to understand. The Greek New Testament was written in Koine Greek. That means street language Greek. Very simple Greek, except for parts of uh, uh, Acts and Luke. It's a very simple Greek language. Okay. Uh, three. There's two related, or actually more than that, related Greek words that are sometimes translated repent or repentance. Um, the main ones I want to talk about are um, metanoia and metanoeo. And there's also metamelomai, and there's a few others that I just don't want to go into because I don't have time. But <clears throat> uh, metanoia is the noun. It means repentance. Now, if you take it apart, it's two basic words. It means meta, which is after or to change, and then noia, which is your mind. You've heard the word metamorphosis, to change forms. Well, metanoia means to change your mind, and the mind is often referred to as your heart. So to have a, a change of heart, have a change in your mind concerning a particular uh, object or uh, situation. Metanoeo is the verbal form uh, to repent. Again, meta, to change, or after, and noeo, to think afterwards, to change your mind. That's what the basic meaning of that word is, and it's the word used in salvation uh, passages. Metamelomai, on the other hand, I know this is a little bit heavy, but I'm just trying to explain how all this confusion comes about, uh, means to have regret or remorse. Um, so how do you define the repentance required for, e for eternal salvation? Um, I taught this in um, Ukraine one time, and it was a Russian-speaking portion, and I asked my interpreter to go look up the word repentance in Russian in a large dictionary, the biggest dictionary she could find in the library. She came back with six different definitions, none of which were the biblical definition to change your mind. And so because this word has become so really uh, tainted with theological meaning, it confuses the unbeliever. And in my opinion, it's better not to use. I never use it uh, in a uh, evangelistic setting. Uh, I was at a Ukraine another time and I preached in this pastor's church. He was a Baptist. And he uh, confronted me afterward and told me I didn't share the gospel. I said, well, yeah, I did. He said, well, you didn't use repentance. And I said, well, how do you define repentance? He says, well, a person has repented and is saved when after one year he comes to church every Sunday, when he gives a tenth of everything that he earns, and then at the end of that year he has to be water baptized, and then he's saved. Just total works. And so it is so misunderstood, it's so abused, especially overseas, even here in, in the States to some degree. People do not understand the basic definition of it. It is used in the New Testament, for example, interchangeably with the word to believe. Uh, for example, in uh, Acts 19, verse 4, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to trust in the one who comes after him. So it's used interchangeably with the word to believe, uh, to believe in Jesus. I forgot to quote the last part of that verse. Uh, also, Acts 20, 21, you might jot that one down, uh, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. 
repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, depends on the translation that you get, but I think that's the more accurate translation. Uh, to have faith in God or trust in God, repentance towards God is the same as to have faith in Christ. Um, also, 11, Acts 11, 17 and 18. Also, Matthew 20, verse 31 and 32, use it in that fashion. Uh, number five, in the context other than a salvation passage, repentance can refer to other types of desired action. Uh, used many times with believers. Uh, Luke 17, 3, it, it says, watch yourself if a brother sins against you. If, if he sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So it's talking about believers, how a believer should repent, change his mind, and recognize that he's wronged someone. It's not talking about eternal salvation. It depends on the context. Context is so important. And sometimes people just pick out verses and make them say whatever they want them to say. Um, context determines the desired action. Um, it's it's kind of like the word jump. Uh, what does jump mean? Well, in the con one context, it means to go jump your battery and start your car. And in another context, it means to go jump in a swimming pool and cool off. In another context, jump might mean jump off a cliff and commit suicide. So context is critical. Uh, you have to determine if it's talking about eternal salvation or being saved from uh, the loss of rewards or being ashamed. The word sozo, saved, I don't have time to go into this, has a much broader meaning than simply to be eternally saved. That's why so many people misinterpret James chapter 2, verse 14. And again, I wish I had time, but I don't have time to go into it. Um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 is another place where repentance is used for believers of the church of Ephesus. Uh, workbook page, was it 15? Is that next? Number 6. One book that never uses the word repent or repentance is the book of John. Why is that significant? The theme of the book of John is found in John 20, 31, where it says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, and that by believing you might have life in his name, eternal life. The whole theme of the book of John in the most simple Greek you can find is to encourage people to believe, to trust in Christ, to be saved. But he does not one time use the word repent. Now he teaches repent. He teaches that people need to stop trusting in their religion, in their religious deeds, and trust in Jesus who is the Christ. So he teaches the concept, but he never uses the word. Number seven. Uh, repentance is not the same as sorrow for sin. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance. Now, the godly sorrow in the first part is lupe in the Greek, and brings repentance is metanoia. So you can feel very sorry about what you've done, and that can lead you to change your mind and to trust in Christ alone. But you can also feel sorry for what you've done and not come to faith in Christ. Uh, I think there's a verse in um, Matthew 27, at least in the King James, that talks about how Judas repented, but it's not the word metanoia or metanoeo, it's the word metamelomai, he regretted, he had a type of sorrow. Okay. Oh. Yeah, there it was. Okay. Number eight, repentance is also brought about by God's kindness. Um, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, God's kindness leads you toward repentance. It was the goodness of God that brought me to, to Christ. I, I began to realize what he had done for me, uh, saved me, sent his son to die in my place. What a kind, what a loving God. He should have struck me dead when I was young. I did some horrible things. I still do. I think the wrong things. I get angry. I, 
all kinds of things going on, on in my heart. The things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do, I don't want to do. Maybe you heard somebody say that before. Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, I am present tense, chief of all sinners. How can Paul say that? How can he say that I am chief of all sinners? Because I believe Paul understood the depth of sin. Some people have a very light view of sin. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't, you know, on and on and on. They don't understand the glory and the holiness and the purity of God. And as a result, they take a very light view of their own sinfulness. And again, it's those who have been forgiven much that do what? Love much. Reason why there's sometimes not a lot of love in church or people's hearts is they don't realize how much they've been forgiven. And that's why I can say there's nobody here that can match me in sin. I am convinced that I have sinned far more than, if you could see my heart right now sometimes, or not now, but hopefully not now, but sometimes, you'd run out of the room with your hair on fire. I don't want to be around this guy. I can, I can be selfish and angry for no reason and, and just, you know, all kinds of stuff going on in my head. I can't, you know, lust after things with my eyes. So God is taking care of about a third of my problem, but the other two thirds makes up for it. You know, the pride of life and the, the lust of the flesh, it's still there. Um, even though I can't have the, you know, the lust of the eyes as such. But anyway, conclusion. Repentance is when a person stops trusting in whatever they're trusting in. They change their mind and they trust in Christ alone. That's biblical repentance. And so I don't use the word because it's got so many different definitions. And that always concerns me. I mean, how many evangelistic uh, messages or materials do you see that add at the end, if you believe and repent? Now, sometimes they say, we well, have to repent of your sins. Anybody here repented of all their sins? Raise your hand. Uh, uh, Joe, let me know. Joe, put your hand down. <laughs> They, they make a requirement, something they haven't done themselves. And then, they, and then you say, well, how many sins do you have to repent from? Well, they don't have an answer for that. So if you don't know how many sins you have to repent from, then how can you know you have eternal life? Well, you can't. And so they throw in all of these words that confuse the unbeliever, and it's usually at the end of the message. And by God's grace, people get saved. You know, so I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm so thankful that... Uh, Christ is preached, and no matter why he's preached and how he's preached, I'm thankful for that. But if I could say one thing, actually three things. When you go out after this seminar, be clear, be clear, be clear. Well, let's go ahead and break right there, and then I think John has some instructions for lunch.